Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the SAMHSA HRSA Center for Integrated Health Solutions, also known as CIHS webcast, titled Back to the Basics, What You Need to Know About Primary and Behavioral Healthcare Integration. My name is Rora Michael, CIHS Associate and your moderator for today's webinar. As you may know, the SAMHSA HRSA CIHS promotes the development of integrated primary and behavioral health services to better address the needs of individuals with mental health and substance use conditions, whether seen in specialty behavioral health or primary care provider settings. In addition to national webinars designed to help providers integrate care, the center is continually, continually posting practical tools and resources to the CIHS website, providing direct phone consultation to providers and stakeholder groups, and directly working with SAMHSA primary and behavioral health care integration grantees and HRSA-funded health centers. To download the presentation slides, please click the drop-down menu labeled Event Resources on the bottom left of your screen. Slides are also available on the CIHS National Council website at, um, located under the tab About Us webinars. During today's presentation, your slides will be automatically synchronized with the audio, so you will not need to flip any slides to follow along. You will listen to audio through your computer speakers, so please ensure they are on and the volume is up. You may submit questions to the speakers at any time during the presentation by typing a question into the Ask a Question box in the lower left portion of your player. Finally, if you need technical assistance, please click on the question mark button in the upper right corner of your player to see a list of frequently asked questions and contact info for tech support if needed. Now I'll turn it over to Laura to introduce um, the speakers today. Thank you. Thank you, Rora. Uh, this is Laura Galbraith. I serve as the director for the SAMHSA HRSA Center for Integrated Health Solutions, and thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us for today's webinar. Um, as Rora mentioned, our center is really focused on the success of providers and clinicians in the field as you try to work to better integrate mental health, primary care, and addiction services. And so we're really excited that you can join us today. And integration has really become quite a hot topic. And we really see it as becoming a standard of care for individuals. So that no, no matter where you present for services, people are looking at your whole health. And so we thought it was really valuable today to start back at kind of that 101. What do we mean about what is integration? And um, we're really excited. And we hope that this re webinar will become a resource for you and your colleagues to help you as you try to communicate um, why integration is important and, and what it's all about, how is it defined and such. And so we're really excited today to have uh, Dr. Joe Parks, who is the Senior Medical Advisor for the National Council for Behavioral Health. He's also the Director of Missouri's HealthNet, which is the Missouri Medicaid Authority. And he's also a leader in the Help Home Community Movement. We have a full bio available on our website for you to read about Dr. Parks, and we're just really pleased he can join us here today to talk about um, what is integration. Um, during the webinar, we'll, we'll be having a very active Q&A session down below. I'll be answering questions and uh, pulling up questions so that when we get to that Q&A portion of the webinar, you can ask your questions of Dr. Parks. We'll also be highlighting some very practical resources as you try to integrate services in your community, as you try to talk about integrated care with the individuals that you serve. And so with that, I'd like to turn it to Dr. Parks to get started as we talk about what is integrated care and back to the basics. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Rora, for getting us started. And thank you, Laura, for uh, getting me introduced. Uh, we're going to go over the basics today. What is integrated care? Why integrate primary and behavioral health care? What are some different approaches? And there's a lot of different ways one can go about this. And then finally, what can you do to get involved and learn more? Because the only point, of course, of uh, watching a presentation like ours is so you can change what you do and do things better in the future. So starting with what is integrated care, it's the care that results from a practice team. So integrated care is team-based care that involves both primary care clinicians and behavioral health clinicians. It involves not just working with patients, but also with their families and attending to those social determinants of health that go on in communities. You use a systematic, usually meaning a data-driven, using uh, 
care registries and other data analytic tools, and cost-effective approach to provide patient-centered care for a defined population. Integrated, in integrated care, the practice considers itself kind of like the public health agency for the clinical population that they are taking care of. It's bi-directional. Integrated care both involves behavioral health care in primary care settings and primary care in behavioral health settings. Uh, I, I really believe that the, uh, the people that are best cited to do integrated care is whoever sees the patient most frequently, because the more frequently you see the patient, the more uh, opportunity you have to coordinate with other care providers and to help the patient change those behaviors that are so important to healthy living and successful treatment outcomes. Most importantly, integration is not about budget lines, it's not about tables of organizations, it's about services. You don't have to merge your organization to integrate your services. There are many merged organizations that don't have integrated services. It can be convenient and helpful, but integration is really about what you do every day and how much effort and time you take to connect with those other providers of care and ask about the other care and get involved with the other care the patient's getting. So why should you go about this? Why, is, why, why would you even want to change what you do? Well, first from the, from the primary care view side, mild to moderate behavioral health problems are extremely common in primary care settings. I'm actually presenting it to you from my primary care clinic where I do psychiatric services. And let me tell you, my primary care colleagues are up to their ears in people with anxiety, depression, and substance use problems. Get a lot of referrals also for attention deficit disorder uh, in the children and other anxiety disorders. On the other side, from the behavioral health side, people with common medical disorders have high rates of behavioral health concerns. It's very, there are increased rates of uh, depression and anxiety related to diabetes, health disease, asthma, and depression. And the outcomes are not as good and the costs are greater if you don't treat both conditions. Their uh, sequential treatment is uh, never a good strategy. Why wait for one thing before treating the other? People with serious mental illness are overrepresented in primary care settings because they have higher rates of chronic medical illness. This is from a study that was done in Maine Medicaid, and they looked at the percentage of uh, different disorders of organ systems based on whether people had serious mental illness, SMI, or whether they didn't have serious mental illness. So the way you would read this graph is for people with skeletal connective tissue problems, arthritis if you will, about not quite 60% of people with serious mental illness had complaints related to their uh, connective tissues and bones. Uh, compared to about 42, 43% of people without mental illness. And you see for each of these different organ systems, whether it's the gastrointestinal system, whether it's uh, COPD is lung disorder, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, hypertension, you see that people with mental illness have higher rates of whatever chronic medical category of chronic medical illnesses is uh, being counted up. So that means that when primary care sees some people with chronic disorders, they are seeing a population that is relatively enriched in people with uh, mental disorders and mental illness also. People seek, uh, commonly seek behavioral health care in primary care. About half of all common psychiatric disorders are seen first in primary care settings. And pe populations of color minorities are even more likely to get their initial uh, care for behavioral health conditions for mental illness and substance abuse in primary care as opposed to behavioral health settings. And Care is more costly. This is the reason payers have become very interested in integrated care. When they run the numbers, they find that having a mental illness is a real marker for your care overall being much more expensive, both the increased costs of your behavioral health care and the increased costs of your chronic medical illnesses and other medical care. This is a study done by a large national actuarial firm called Milliman that compared the average cost uh, per member per month. That's the way payers look. PMPM PM is per member per month for commercial insurance in the private sector, for people covered by Medicare, and for people cover covered by Medicaid. So you see for commercial insurance, uh, the average cost per member per month is around $380. 
for people with no mental disorder. When people have a mental disorder, and that includes substance abuse in this study, it goes up about three times as much to around $1,200 per member per month. In Medicare, and remember Medicare is a mixed population, it's part elderly and part people with disabilities, they're about $600 per member per month with no mental disorder or substance use disorder, going up to $1,400 per member per month, more than twice that, if there is a mental disorder or substance use disorder. And the same for Medicaid, but again, remember Medicaid is a mixed population. About 75% are low-income women and children, but about 25% are people with disabilities, and they have have very different cost patterns. A lot of this cost is due to the complexity of having multiple illnesses. When people have a couple mental disorders, they usually have several chronic medical disorders at the same time. So the way you read this graph is the first, the middle bar is the percentage of patients. So you see only about 2% of patients have high complex multiple diagnoses, physical comorbidities, uh, serious chronic illness goes up to about 11% with chronic disease and moderate to acute illnesses. About 90% of people have self-resolving illnesses and low-grade acute illnesses. That 90% accounts for only one-third of the costs. And that small 3% of people with high health complexity accounts for about a third of the costs. So there's a small population, and the population that has serious chronic illness and health, high health complexity almost uniformly have behavioral health conditions along with their chronic medical illnesses. So why would people look for behavioral health in primary care settings? Well, some, often that's the only place you can get care if you're uninsured or underinsured. Uh, there's limited access to public mental health services. That funding's been historically restricted. It is not kept up with inflation. Uh, a lot of people uh, just are scared of behavioral health treatment. It's, you know, they think it says something bad about them if they're seen in those clinics and they're afraid of other people's attitudes. And there's a problem with availability for mental health services, especially in rural areas. So without integration, mental illnesses tend to go undetected and untreated. When primary care providers do detect mental illnesses, they have a tendency to undertreat. They, they, they are more likely to give less than effective uh, dosage levels of antidepressants and other medications for treating mental illness. Populations of color, minorities, children, adolescents, older adults, uninsured, often receive inadequate care for their mental health problems. Uh, and I can see I've run a little off on my substance abuse slide. Uh, substance abuse care usually also is involved uh, in the same populations and in primary care. So our problem that I've laid out for you is that early death from physical illness prevents recovery from serious mental illness. And let me walk you through those numbers. People with mental illness actually don't live as long as people without mental illness. This is a combination of a couple different uh, epidemiological studies put together by Ben Druss at Emory. Uh, people with no mental disorder in the general population live to be about 78 years old. People with any mental disorder in the general population are living to about 65, 66 years old, 12 to 15 years shorter life expectancy. In the public health system, in the, in the, particularly in the public mental health system, people are living into their mid-50s, uh, an early mortality of about 15 to 25 years earlier related to having a mental illness. Certainly a cause for concern if you're doing general medical treatment because 88% of the deaths and 83% of the premature years of life lost in people in the public mental health system are due to cardiovascular disease, diabetes, respiratory disease, infectious disease. They are not due to suicide or accidents. They are mostly due to chronic medical conditions that occur at a much higher prevalence in people with serious mental illness and are much less likely to get effective treatment. Health behaviors represent about 40% of the preventable causes of death. Social environmental factors that uh, are often problematic in people with mental illness account for another 20%. Actually, healthcare services only uh, uh, account for about 10% of preventable health causes of death. 
So it's these health behaviors that are addressed in the integrated care setting more effectively than in siloed care. We're having trouble advancing on this one. There. Oh. Excuse me. There we go. So the early cause, the early death is due to a cumulative effect of many problems. Much of it is due to modifiable risk factors. People with mental illness smoke at higher rates. They're more likely to be overweight and more likely to be inactive. They also are more socially isolated. They don't get those common supports we get to be healthy and to get our illness treated that we get from friends and family because the symptoms of mental illness often disrupt those healthy social relationships. They're more likely not to have money. They're more likely to be unemployed. They don't have as much access to care, and they're more likely to be on multiple medications, often a dozen or more medications, hard to keep straight, easy to make a lot of errors. And then, of course, these are people whose illnesses cause difficulties with concentration, memory, perseverance on task, executive function, yet we expect them to keep track of 10 or 12 different providers a year, 10 or 12 different medications, it's a hard administrative task, even if it was with somebody whose symptoms didn't interfere with their ability to concentrate, organize, and follow through. Much of the death in people with serious mental illness is related to cardiovascular risk factors. Uh, people are about twice as likely to be obese uh, when they have schizophrenia or bipolar disorder than the general population. They are about three times as likely to smoke. The rates of smoking are as high as 55% in bipolar disorder, 50 to 80% in people with schizophrenia, compared to down around 20% in the general population. Uh, twice as likely to have diabetes, uh, somewhat higher rate of hypertension, much higher rates of dyslipidemia, of having high blood fats, which of course clogs up the artery and leads to heart attacks and higher rates of metabolic syndrome. In the general population, about one in five men have metabolic syndrome, one in four women, and in uh, people with uh, serious mental illness, it's closer to 40%. What's metabolic syndrome? It's having three out of five risk factors, high blood pressure, being overweight, having poor glucose control, and having low levels of the good cholesterol and high levels of the bad cholesterol. If you have metabolic syndrome, three out of those five, you're as likely to have a heart attack in the next 10 years as somebody who's already had a heart attack. So these risk factors really add up, and that's what drives that higher rate of mortality in people with uh, mental illness compared to the general population. And cigarette smoking is a biggie. People with schizophrenia or with bipolar disorder are currently about 60% of them smoke. This compares with about 20% of the general population. 44% of all cigarettes consumed nationally are smoked with pe by people with serious mental illness. A huge need for treatment in that area. Mental illness often comes with comorbid alcohol use disorders, which of course also complicate medical, uh, medical treatment. Here you see the uh, general population There's, uh, has alcohol problems in about 13, 14% of people. People with bipolar disorder, closer to around 40%, with schizophrenia around one third, slightly higher with uh, unipolar depression. So in primary care settings, people with behavioral health concerns are less likely to get effective medical care. They're less likely to get the routine screening. They have difficulty establishing relationships with primary care providers. Time limitations can be a problem. You know, uh, primary care is on a pretty tight clock. They have to move people in and out because their waiting rooms are full. And attending to people's substance use disorders and mental illness simply takes more time. You have to sit down and talk, and that can really throw a primary care physician off schedule, which really kind of gives them a hidden incentive to not attend to that as much as would be uh, optimal. Another excellent reason that we need to have integrated care. The rates of non-treatment are particularly problematic. Now, I showed, I showed you the higher rates of people with uh, hypertension, diabetes, 
and dyslipidemia, high levels of the bad cholesterol. There was a large multi-center national study done on people with schizophrenia looking at what the best medication for treating their psychosis was done in uh, from 2000 about 2000 to 2004 but as part of that study they looked at the rates of diabetes hypertension and dyslipidemia and the rates of treatment they found that of the some 80 percent 88 percent of people uh, 70 percent of people with dyslipidemia about 88 percent were not being treated of about the 33% with uh, hypertension, about 62% were not being treated, and of the 11% with diabetes, 30% were not being treated. These are missing over half the hypertension, over three-quarters of the dyslipidemia, and almost a third of the diabetes in clinics that can do multi-center national research but apparently can't detect and treat, get hypertension or dyslipidemia treated. This is something we really need to change in our treatment systems and is a major target for integrated care. So these are are some of the reasons, but I'll give you a few more as to why primary care services need uh, to be uh, in mental health settings. There are high rates of the physical illnesses, premature mortality, people with mental illness get lower quality uh, care in primary care settings, and it's associated with high costs to summarize, uh, finally topped off by access problems. So our mission is recovery. So what are we going to do about this? Well, the principle that we assert in the uh, Center for Health Integrated Solutions is that physical health care is a core service for people with serious mental illness and that mental health systems have a primary responsibility to assure that the people they serve get general preventive health care and that they get management and integration of their medical care. That's because the mental health system is where these people are most frequently seen and has the greatest opportunity to get them better treatment and make a change in their treatment. Integrating care offers important opportunities to reduce the the healthcare disparities, eliminate the early mortality gap, to reach out to people who cannot or will not access care outside the specialty health setting, and to intervene before people get so sick that they end up in the hospital or worse dead. There's a lot of drivers for demand for integration in healthcare reform. The uh, Affordable Care Act insurance reforms and coverage expansions provide new coverage for many people that need and want behavioral health services. It has really unlocked a lot of pent-up demand. Uh, the accountable, the Affordable Care Act requires that uh, the new pop- covered populations get uh, their care at parity. Their mental health and substance use services must be covered as well as their general medical services. And there are multiple initiatives, demonstration projects, and incentive payments uh, within health care reform that incentivize the integration of behavioral health and general medical care. The other drivers is stigma is down. This is good news. People are more willing to seek treatment for either mental illness or addiction, but that, again, releases pent-up demand. More demand is a challenge for the existing treatment systems to handle in terms of getting people access. And, of course, when we all read the papers, we see a greater uh, need of the awareness to increase access to mental health and addiction treatment. Other reasons? Patients actually prefer it. If you ask most people, they don't want to have to keep track of going to separate clinics, giving separate histories, doing separate intakes, uh, getting separate bills. It's really more convenient for the patient. Now, unintegrated care is mostly there because it's administratively convenient for the providers. If we want to make it convenient for the patients, we integrate it. Uh, Referral success rates when primary care refers to behavioral health or when behavioral health refers to primary care. In separate settings, only about one in five patients carry through, follow through and make that other appointment. In integrated settings, it goes up to about half. Still a problem, but a great increase in following through on that referral if it's in an integrated setting. Integration builds personal relationships between the providers, and that's really the way that we get things done is when we know each other. You're more likely to take a phone call from someone you have a personal relationship, from someone you see in clinic, from someone you've been face-to-face with in meetings, uh, than from somebody who just you know their title from across town. 
It allows a more accurate understanding of each other's incentives, methods, and constraints. I've often been uh, in discussions where primary care would feel that mental health providers were doing something foolish, but they didn't understand what got paid and what didn't get paid and how care was organized. I've been in the same similar meetings on behavioral health side where they thought primary care was doing things that were frustrating or foolish, but they didn't really have an understanding of why that was organized that way on primary care side. We can't really be generous and cooperative with each other unless we have an accurate understanding of each other's incentives, methods, and constraints. Uh, one thing I enjoy about practicing in primary care is all the opportunities for informal consultation. I can't, every time I'm in the hall, uh, I'll grab another care, one of the primary care physicians, or they'll grab me and uh, we'll go over a case that we just saw or just about to see, and we wouldn't have that communication if we weren't bumping into each other. And of course, being on a single medical record reduces those medical errors, so people get less error-prone care. So I've talked about some problems. I want you to remember, no, how, no matter how great and destructive your problems seem now, you've probably only seen the tip of them. So that means I'm about to show you a few more problems. There are barriers to providing primary care to psychiatric populations. Some of those are cultural barriers. Uh, mental health staff and patients are not used to incorporating primary care as part of the job. Mental health staff feel a lot of time pressure. It's hard to add screening or checking vital signs, and it feels like it's out of the scope of their practice. There are financial barriers. Uh, the billing units are not always there, or, the, or sometimes uh, behavioral health simply doesn't know how to bill for primary care. It can be challenging. Uh, there can be high no-show rates, which take extra time. And, st and psychiatric staff, in particular, often don't have the time to provide case, uh, aren't funded to get uh, care management assistance to take the vital signs and blood pressure uh, before the visit. Motivational problems, there's a lack of perceived need for integrated care and a lack of motivation as part of the negative symptoms of some of the mental illnesses. Organizational, it can be hard to time, find time, space, and money. Uh, primary care and behavioral health, to some extent, speak different languages, and that's why that personal relationship is important so you can come to understand each other. Often behavioral health electronic health records may not have the capacity to track physical health, and physical health electronic medical records won't have the kind of treatment planning platforms that we like to see in behavioral health. Uh, the clinic locations are not always close, not always in the same building, so somebody's got to move, and that is an administrative cost and an administrative hassle. There are patient-level factors. Many of the illnesses we treat, uh, some of the symptoms are a lack of motivation. They, uh, there's often problems with memory, with concentration. People are so concerned with the distress of their mental health, they pre frankly don't have time to get worried about their general health care. Many of our patients in behavioral health are more likely to have uh, little income, often comorbidity with alcohol. Past experiences leave them with feelings of fear and distrust. They can have difficulty communicating. All of this interferes with access to care. The provider factors are not entirely different. There's often fear and distrust between primary care and behavioral health providers, discomfort of treating symptoms from the other part of the field, Fear that it'll take too long, uh, that it'll hurt the bottom line, not having enough knowledge about the other conditions, and then a tendency to attribute physical symptoms to mental illness and to miss those physical problems, both on the primary care side and on the behavioral health side. So what is what is effective integrated care? I've been I've been promoting that we ought to be doing this. Just what am I talking about exactly that I want you to do? Well, the principles of effective integrated health care is that it's person-centered, it's team care, uh, co-location alone is not enough, it's, uh, it often is very helpful and can make, uh, uh, can make collaboration and integration much easier, but in and of itself it's insufficient. It's population-based care. People are tracked in a registry. We're not waiting for the patient to figure out what's wrong with them and come get to us with a patient complaint. We're using data analytics to find those care gaps before people become dreadfully ill. It's measurement-based treat-to-target. We, we track symptom levels, we track blood pressure, and we move those numbers over time. We pull out the people who aren't getting better and target them for more attention. It's evidence-based care. Treatments used are evidence-based, and we use data 
to uh, pick out who we need to focus on. And because of that data, providers can be held accountable, which makes payers more willing to reimburse them for high quality care and not just volume of care provided. Uh, in my work with the Medicaid directors, let me tell you that they are very focused on accountable care. They're very focused on doing pay for performance and paying higher rates for higher quality care. Integrated care is in many ways based on the Wagner chronic care model. I would urge you to uh, check out the resources online that Laura will show you at the end. You can find more information on the Wagner chronic care. It really talks to the interaction between the health system, the community, the healthcare organization, and how they all interact through a multidisciplinary team to result in an informed, activated patient working with their family for improved outcomes. It is a systems approach to thinking about healthcare, how healthcare occurs. And so it's uh, beyond, it's really a whole presentation in and of itself. This is just to get you aware that when you uh, have opportunity to learn more about the Wagner chronic care model, it would be time well spent. The standard framework for integration, it comes in stages, often the lowest level, and we'll go into the levels a little more detail next, is the coordination level, uh, where you discuss the patients and exchange information if needed. It's really collaboration at a distance. There's co-location, where you can get in the same facility, may share some of the same function and staffing and discuss some patients. And then there's full integration. Uh, where you have merged workflows, you're interspersed, you don't have people in uh, behavioral health people in a separate part of the building or a separate part of the clinic. And there are standing meetings uh, to assure that people really do talk to each other and it isn't just uh, haphazard. SAMHSA has come up with a uh, model of collaboration and integration consisting of six levels. It starts with coordinated care where the key elements coordination, the lowest level, level one, there's really minimal collaboration, and level two is basic collaboration, but it is a distance. You're exchanging information regularly, but you're never getting face-to-face -face with each other. Co-located care, the key element is physical proximity. Uh, the basic level here is collaboration at the same site, and level four takes it up to closer collaboration with some system integration. You may be sharing the same electronic medical record. You may be more interspersed physically in the clinic instead of separate parts. Integrated care, the key element is practice change. It's not just about changing where, who you talk to. It's not just about changing where your office is. It's about changing how you do the whole series of actions that constitute the care that you provide. Uh, level five is close collaboration, approaching a full integrated practice, and level six is full collaboration with a merged integrated practice that's using data-driven decision-making uh, and individual decision support in a collaborative model to deliver care on a population basis. You're just not taking care of the patients one at a time. You're picking out of your population the people that need attention this week because their numbers just aren't looking right. Here's some of the level of differences by level of integration. So for proximity, it, it increases from being in separate facilities to in the same facility in separate space to sharing some space to sharing all the space and being really interspersed. The lower levels of collaboration have separate systems. As you go up the levels, you're more sharing and more fully integrated in systems like electronic medical records, scheduling systems, uh, timekeeping systems. Communication improvements are key. At level one, there's only rare uh, rare communication based on provider need, rising up to periodic communication based on patient need, into regular communication, then frequent communication, and then consistently both through individuals and through teams. And that comes with more face-to-face -face time until at the highest level, level six of integration, you're meeting on a daily basis, often in an early morning huddle, to decide what is most urgent to do that day. Another way to think about it is where is the patient, where, where would be the logical place for what type of patient to go? This is the four quadrant model that was put together by the National Council almost 10 years ago now. And it breaks people into whether they are high or low behavioral risk, 
on the uh, x-axis and high or low physical health risk on the y-axis. So people that are low behavioral health risk and low physical risk, they're really best off in primary care, which is where we all get our ongoing care when we're basically healthy. We go kitty corner to that to people that are high behavioral health risk and high physical health risk. This is really the kind of person that needs full integrated care. We go to the two other quadrants, quadrant two and quadrant three, high behavioral health risk, low physical health risk, and quadrant two is a place where you'd be perhaps getting your uh, primary care integrated by your behavioral health provider because they see you more often. And quadrant three, it's the opposite. You have low behavioral health but some, and high physical health, you'd be getting your behavioral health coordinated by your primary health provider. But this is an algorithm that needs to be worked out locally in each community. It's a way to have that discussion of who's going to uh, be more focused on which pop patient population in the community. There's a number of developing uh, models nationally. There's a, a model called PCARE, Primary Care Access, Referral and Evaluation. Uh, the National Council is a major partner with SAMHSA in developing the primary and behavioral health care integration uh, grantee sites, hundreds of sites across the country, uh, CMHCs that are actively coordinating the full health care needs of their members. Uh, there are about uh, 15, uh, no, about 17 states now that are doing state plan amendments for health homes for people with chronic conditions. This allows for enhanced Medicaid funding for people with serious mental illness and also allows for integrating behavioral health uh, care and treatment and coordination into a community health center. So the uh, 2703 Health Home is really about that bi-directional integration we talked about earlier in the presentation. So what do you do to integrate behavioral health into primary care? Well, physician training, screening, referral is helpful, but not sufficient. Beyond that, you need a couple other things. One of the models is the behavioral health consultant model. This is a behavioral health specialist who shadows primary care and steps in on a case where there's psychological problems like anxiety and depression or a substance use problem, or if there's psychosocial components of uh, chronic physical illness. People get traumatized and are anxious when they get a new diagnosis of cancer or diabetes, and that changes their behavior and really may merits behavioral health support. Behavioral health consultant makes it much more comfortable for that primary care provider to broach these issues because they have somebody to hand off to, somebody to collaborate with right there in their clinic. The strongest evidence base for integration in primary care is the collaborative care model that uses data-based, data-driven care. It has more than 25 years of research, more than 38 randomized trials. Oops, let's see. The key ingredient there is care management. They use psychiatrists, but the psychiatrist is mostly a consultant working through a care manager who's advising the primary care physician, and they have data systems. They measure the symptoms at every visit, and when people aren't getting better, they pick out the people that aren't getting better, and they change something. It's about identifying cases that aren't going well and then changing something so they have a chance to get better. Another major uh, integrative model in primary care is brief screening and intervention, SBIRT, and referral to treatment. It identifies people with risky, high-risk behaviors related to alcohol and substance use and gives them very brief interventions. Like the behavioral health consultants, this is not ongoing behavioral health care. It's a brief series of one to maybe four interventions uh, that gets peop identifies people earlier and gets them back on track fast. In terms of integrating primary care into behavioral health, the same uh, principles apply. You need to be screening. Uh, the, uh, the health homes for people in CMHCs are tracking metabolic syndrome. They are responsible for checking people's blood pressure, for checking their lipids, for making sure their blood sugar is under control, for following their weight. They add wellness programs uh, for increased physical activity, decreased weight, some diabetes education, and they practice collaborative care from the behavioral health side by tracking these levels and when people aren't getting better by intervening with their primary care physicians and their behavioral health physicians to change something in the treatment so the care can be improved. 
Nationally, there's a broad movement for patient-centered medical homes, more on the primary care side. It involves uh, a patient-centered medical home. Everybody has an assigned primary care provider. The team works collectively with a responsibility for ongoing care. It's a whole-person approach, and they are all required to have some behavioral health capacity. Uh, their certification requirements include attending to behavioral health either through outside collaboration or internal integration. Same thing with person-centered healthcare homes that are providing primary care or assuring that it occurs on the behavioral health side. So this really can be done from either side of the equation. Well, how do the patients feel about this? Basically, they like it. They have higher satisfaction with their access to care. They feel that there's more attention to their treatment preferences. Uh, they feel that there's better coordination and continuity of care, and their overall care is better in three separate studies here. Here's a couple quotes. Uh, here's one from a clinic right here in Missouri where I'm speaking to you from. Jackie said it was great to have my two providers in the same building because they talk to each other at the time of the problem rather than having me wait until I see the next one at another appointment. She didn't like getting bounced back and forth like, and she doesn't anymore. Here's one from Cassandra McAllister in Ypsilanti, Michigan. Around the time my bipolar condition was identified, I was also found to have kidney disease. Between the two disorders, I was real, it was very upsetting. My doctors, dialysis clinic staff, mental health case managers are well-connected. They use a team approach. They check on the status of my health, and I feel like I have control of my health. It doesn't control me. This is the kind of outcomes you can get with integrated care activated, empowered people that are taking direct responsibility and really doing much better at lower cost. So how can you get involved and how can you learn more? Well, there's some common themes on the way to integration. You start with building relationships, build on communication. You need to study up on the models, and there's several models. None are <clears throat> All are necessary, none alone are sufficient. You may need to make some physical structure modifications, and there's always an, a lot of training that's uh, necessary to get to integrated care. Hopefully, you'll be able to get to your state to revise some of the regulations to support it and to get the billing codes you need to pr support in, uh, integration. I'm seeing more and more willingness nationally, especially in the Medicaid space, for payers. To, uh, they want to pay for integrated care. They want to help providers to get there. What really makes it possible is working on your relationships with your other providers in your community. It requires a basic trust between part care provider partners. It requires a willingness to use data transparently and to, for everybody to look at each other's data and not hide it just because it's not all good. Uh, many of you listening today I know are behavioral health providers, so you know something about motivational interviewing. Well, it works great with your primary care colleagues. It works great with local hospitals. I would also recommend a book called Principled Negotiation, Getting to Yes, as a uh, organizational variant on motivational interviewing. It requires a willingness of us all to tolerate and share risk, but most of all, you have to change yourself first. Too often I see people trying to approach collaboration by wanting the other entity to change first, and that's poor leadership. If you want to lead, you go first. That means you're willing to change yourself and your organization before expecting the other guy to change. If you don't like the way it's going, remember, the only consistent feature in all of your dissatisfying relationships is you. And that's really the only thing that we really can change at the end of the day is ourselves. Everybody else changes in reaction to the change that we make in ourselves. In behavioral health, we haven't always been real good about how we've approached partnership. We often approach partnership by explaining how we're short on resources, how we've been neglected, how we're unloved, we're not respected. None of that is an attractive way to approach a partner. When you're looking for a partner, instead of talking about your needs first, you should ask them about their needs. Instead of asking for something, you should figure out some way to help them with a problem that they see as a problem from their perspective. Don't limit your assistance to just the project you want to do now. Assist them wherever you can, wherever you see somewhere that you think you could be useful to them. Don't make it about the current deal. Make it about the next 10 deals. Almost everybody you partner with in the provider community is going to be around there in the next decade. 
Don't uh, push a specific position. Talk about your common interests. Don't withhold information. Reveal everything that's helpful. And most of all, be loyal. If your partner's in trouble on a tough case, if they're getting beat up politically or in the press or uh, legally, and you can help them out, wait in there and help them out. Loyalty is key to long-term partnerships. You need to stick with your partners. These are the end of my prepared comments. We'll take comments in just a minute, but I have to do the obligatory slide in all such presentations as mine on change. Change. When the winds of change blow hard enough, the most trivial things can turn into deadly projectiles. So my question for you on the webinar is, where do you want to be in this picture? Are you worried that you'll be the thing that's hit by the projectile? Do you sometimes feel like the projectile being blown in the wind? If you're willing to change yourself, if you're willing to start making database decisions and start integrating chair, you can be the win. You can be the change that drives all of the healthcare system to a better place. Thank you for your time, and I think we're open for questions now, Laura. Yes, thank you, Dr. Parks. Uh, really appreciate going through and making sure that we all understand the basics of what is integrated care, why is it important, and what are some of the fundamental things to understand and to share. Many folks are asking about um, will they have access to these slides. Yes, we will be there. They should be on the website now and available for you to download. We're also willing to give them to you in other formats to or if you want specific slides um, and statistics, we're here to help you as you try to make that case um, with your colleagues, with your community partners, and others on why to do integrated care. Um, and we've got some great questions, so let me dive in, and then um, please feel free to type in a question at any time. Um, and actually, I'm sorry, before we go to questions, there are a couple of key resources that I've been copying and sharing with some of you, but that I want to highlight. And everything that I'm about to share with you is available on our website at integration.samhsa.gov. If you have any problems finding those resources, please email us at integration at the National Council. Next slide. A couple of the ones that um, you may have heard Dr. Park reference. Uh, one is our standard framework for levels of integrated care, which kind of laid out that what does it look like from being co-located to a really fully integrated uh, provider setting. And all of these are hyperlinks that will be available on those slides that you can get to. Um, as part of that, we have some really great assessment tools. How do you tell whether your site is fully integrated? Where are you on that continuum? Um, how do I assess where are some strengths as we try to do integration? We've got some great tools that we're using that were developed by CMS and other partners um, that are really valuable. Certainly the Lexicon for Behavioral Health has a, by ARC, um, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, has a great definition. Our link to the four quadrant model, which is an excellent piece to have as part of a conversation about where best to serve the population in, in your communities. Next. A couple of other key resources is a quick start guide. This was developed to help primary care settings um, think through those initial steps of bringing in behavioral health, mental health, and addictions. Our core competencies for integrated behavioral health really are designed to help you think about how do I bed this as my, my workforce, my team? How are, how are we building, building this into our job descriptions, our performance reviews, um, really kind of looking at what are the characteristics for our workforce? Certainly billing and financing we've developed for every single state. Um, it is a little... Um, it was a period of time in which you can see which codes are available to you in that state to be able to help you and support your integration efforts. And then certainly some lessons learned that we've been gathering across different um, sites. There are new tools constantly being developed by the center and also a wide range of partners, including some exciting things coming out of some of our federal uh, partners that we'll be promoting. So please make sure to sign up to visit the website and make sure that you're getting our emails. So with that, um, we'll go to the next slide and we'll take some questions. The first question Dr. Parks I thought was an interesting one. Um, they needed some help in communicating about mild to moderate behavioral health. So when you look at that four quadrant model and we think about people with mild to moderate mental illness or addictions, how to, how to talk about that or define that without people going to the worried well. 
So if you have any mm-hmm. thoughts on that. Well, you know, I think if you talk to your, uh, I, I always like to talk about it best when I have my primary care people with me because they'll immediately jump in and say that that takes about half their day and that these people are not well because they're in their primary care clinic all the time talking about their distress, how they're fatigued, they're not sleeping, uh, they they have low energy, uh, they're not thinking straight. These, uh, I, I so... I, it's certainly dismissive to talk about them as worried well, and I think primary care can be some of our strongest supporters in making the point that mild to moderate anxiety and depression are a huge part of health care. Uh, they lower productivity at the work site. People miss days of work. The major cause of missed days of work is depression and anxiety more than infectious disease. It's the uh, biggest disabler out there. Uh, those are my initial thoughts. I, I would try and I think it's a good reason to buddy up and team up with your primary care colleagues because they'll come to your defense on that. Great, thank you. Um, somebody was asking about case conferences and what the opportunity is there with integrated care. Do you have any thoughts on case conferences and the opportunity it presents for integrated care? Case conferences are a very powerful tool because case conferences are not only the way we solve, we come up with solutions for a particular couple of patients, it's the way we teach each other how the other thinks. So it's very common in uh, integrated settings to have a case conference where the primary care provider will talk for three to five minutes about what they're thinking about the person. The behavioral health provider will think to three to five minutes. If they have a community support or community support worker, they'll talk about what it's like for the person out in the out in the community. And that gives primary care a way to hear how the psychiatrist thinks and what's going on at home. It gives the psychiatrist a way to hear a, uh, or the uh, psychologist a way to hear how primary care thinks. And that's how we really integrate care is by learning to look at the illness like our colleagues look at it also and to treat that whole person. But the most valuable thing that you should always try and get out of a case conference is not just what are we going to do to change the patient's care. You should come out of every case conference with one thing you can do as an organization to change how you deliver care. The case conference should not be just about fixing the patient. It should be about fixing your care delivery methods so they can be a little better for all the other patients in your practice like that patient. What's, how do you need to do screening different, or what screening do you need to do? What additional staff education is needed? You know, these case conferences always turn up problems in our care delivery, problems in, you know, how we've educated and trained ourselves and our staff. So the goal should be both something that will help the patients you've reviewed, but also something that will change what you do at your clinic, at your community mental health center, that will make it better for all the people like them. Thank you. We've had several questions um, on how do you pay for integrated care, Um, and I think, you know, I referenced our billing worksheet, so there are financing options now, but, you know, somebody was asking specifically about um, CMS has said that they have supported the the integration model. What type of interventions or uh, other system redesigns are happening that kind of are where integration is being folded in. Could you speak a little bit to that? So CMS uh, and and the CPT coding people with the support of the American Medical Association have been steadily adding more and more integrated uh, integration codes year over year. The newest one that just got announced this last week is uh, psychiatrist collaboration codes to support the collaborative care model. So there's now a billing code where the psychiatrist can bill for giving feedback based on information from a case manager that allows them to make advice to a primary care provider. There was no way to bill for that. They just announced new billing codes that should go live in the next few months over that. It's been recommended for the next round of code changes. It'll probably be more like six to nine months. There are now uh, codes for health behavior assessment intervention, which is one of the major ways that behavioral health consultants bill. Uh, They changed all the physician codes that psychiatrists use to the same kind of codes that primary care uses. I use what's called an evaluation and management set of codes, which is the same code set that my primary care colleagues use. 
which makes it much easier for psychiatrists to bill in uh, primary care systems. Uh, there are billing codes for SBIRT, and some pay, like any other billing code, some pay better and some pay worse. But there, there's a steady drumbeat. It does take, you really need to check out these resource guides they have at CHIS, because, of course, billing is all down in the weeds. And it's also very local. And clinics that were allowed to bill in one state, a similar clinic wouldn't be allowed to bill in another state because of some licensing laws that some states have that are problematic. And this is some of the political work that remains to be done. Uh, you know, there are a number of states that have regulations that you can't, a behavioral health provider can't do primary care, can't do medical care. That's archaic, and we need to be politically active and get that changed. And I'll tell you, payers are increasingly interested in changing that and getting care in one place and getting it integrated. So don't be afraid to approach your two or three major payers that you do most of your business with and say, hey, here's our vision, here's where we want to go. You know, how how can, you know, let's have a dialogue. What can you change? What do you already allow that we don't know about? Uh, they're getting more engaged. I know managed care companies can be tough to talk to, but they are they're making their they're making their attempts in this area. Thank you. And I do want to ask um, one last question before I turn it over to Aurora. And thank you. So many of you have submitted questions. Obviously, we will not have time to get through all of them. We have um, close to 1,300 people live on today's webinar. So we will try to do some follow-up. You can always email us if you have a pressing need or resource or a question. We will certainly follow up with you. Um, Dr. Parks, the last question is kind of uh, just to summarize some questions I've seen on workforce. Lots of questions about the implications for the current workforce as well as our uh, future nurses, mental health professionals, peers, and so forth. Um, any thoughts on just big picture? How do we uh, think about integrated care and how do we train the current and future workforce? Well, you know, there is such increased demand both on for primary care and for psychiatry that we're, we're going to we have been seeing increased use of physician extenders, and we're going to see even more. Uh, it's it's essential that you know we we have uh, the the highest credential people really focus their credentials just on the sickest people or the toughest questions. And that we we delegate to others anything that anybody else can do with decent training and some uh, quality assurance follow up. So I think that that talks to team care and getting it done in a team and not having a person responsible for the whole thing, but having a group of people responsible for a whole range of activities. Uh, I think uh, one the most important thing a primary care organization is to get somebody on staff that knows something about behavioral health. Get that first behavioral health consultant in. Get some little bit of of consulting uh, psychologist or psychiatrist time. Get your toe in the water. The same thing for behavioral health organizations. The most important thing you can do is to get some staff in that knows something about primary care. In uh, Missouri, it was game changing when all the CMHCs added uh, primary care nurses. Uh, it started with just one for each agency, and it is caught on like wildfire. And now they wonder how they could ever do business without those primary care nurses around. Thank you. And we have lots of resources, lessons learned, um, examples that you can go and visit or learn about. Um, there's just been a wonderful wave of development when it comes to integration um, that we're really excited to connect you with. And so thank you, Dr. Parks. And with that, I will turn it over to Aurora. All right. That is all the time we have today. Once again, recording and transcription of this webinar will be available on the CIHS website. Um, once you exit the webinar, you will be asked to complete a short survey. Please be sure to offer your feedback on today's webinar. Your input is important to us and informs the development of future CIHS or National Council webinars. I would like to extend a thank you to our presenter, Dr. Parks, for joining us on today's webinar. Thank you all for joining our webinar, and please stay tuned for more webinars in the near future. Have a great afternoon. Bye, everyone. Thanks. <laughs>